This video is going to provide you with a chance to get just a quick initial understanding of this complex work on the time image by Deleuze. I think you need an initial grasp for yourself before tackling full-on Deleuze and I've been arguing that throughout this series of videos. I have more detailed notes on both books on the cinema on my website. I've given all the references on the transcript as usual. What I'm going to do again is to focus on the philosophical bits here, assuming that they will be the ones that are least familiar for film students. There is actually a lively debate about whether the main theme of the book is really philosophical anyway, rather than cinematic. Um, this is taken up especially in Badiou's book. Certainly both philosophy and comment on film are mixed together. Uh, we've tried to choose the most accessible examples of films as illustrations. Uh, luckily a lot of them are accessible these days and you might want to test out some Deleuzean readings on these films for yourself. As we said in the earlier video, for example, Deleuze's readings are very centered and you might easily see all sorts of other things going on in the films as well, not just philosophy. To start off we can think of the time image in Bergson's sense, that is as a philosophical conception of time. This will not be an ordinary conception of time indicated by clocks or calendars. What we'll do is get a series of arguments about the conception of time from Bergson and then try to see how the films illustrate these arguments by developing various signs and sequences of signs of their own. Now Deleuze actually offers his own summary of the key bits from Bergson on pages 82 to 3 of the second book on cinema, Cinema 2, Deleuze 1989. There are also lots of other resources on Bergson including my own notes on my website if you want them. What I'm going to do is give a quick sketch of Deleuze's position here, perhaps with some added bits, I hope a bit more explanation, one or two simplifications and no doubt some vulgarizations as well. Bergson talks about time first of all in terms of how it affects human beings and this is particularly well developed in his famous book Matter and Memory. Human beings obviously spend a lot of time engaged in activity with the real world and they experience it through sense impressions or sensations. They have perceptions of the world which result in actions and in normal action the gap in between is filled with affections which are impulses again coming from the outside. Now we saw exactly that notion being used to explain the movement image in the earlier video. However, in practice something else also intervenes in the gap between perception and action. Memory so the first thing the time image has to show is how memory works. For Bergson memory operates at a number of levels. At the level closest to practice it supplies us with automatic or habitual ways of acting that we've learned in the past so that I just know how to ride a motorbike or swim because I've learned to do so in the past. We're talking here about something that my colleagues in sports science used to call muscle memory or bodily memory. However, sometimes memory does not provide us with an automatic connection with the present and we have to do something more deliberate, go back to another level of memory, try to recollect something that's happened in the past that's going to help us in the present. There's a further level still at which memory works to contain all the understandings provided by the past all our experience, whether or not that has immediate implications for action, usually it doesn't. This is pure memory and we can access it by a particular act of placing ourselves in the past, usually by recollecting some particularly significant moment, some shining point as Bergson calls it, or a theme. Once we are there back in the past, we can then extend the links to other memories located in the same level of the past or in others. If we could do this fully, we would be able to recapture all our former past life. 
In practice, before long, the present intervenes and sets its agenda, requiring us to act and to get on with forming practical recollections at the middle level. However, we can get close to living in pure memory, where the demands of the present are minimised, and the most common occurrence is when we dream. So, film is going to have to show us how memories operate. The movement image film has already shown the automatic link between bodily memories and action. But recollection and its connections with pure memory also need to be shown. And one way is to do this through dream sequences, as we'll see. Memory has a major influence on what we do in the present and it's always crowding in on us and our perceptions and feelings. The past exerts pressure, most obviously through automatic recollection, but the other levels of memory influence us too, although we might not be so aware of it. In general, our total experiences make us what we are. We gain experience. We have endured. We have persisted over time. We've experienced duration, in Bergson's famous term. This is not going to be easily measured in clock time, as so many hours or years or whatever, because we know that the quality of our experience can vary so much. A moment can be as important as a year. Clock time is no good because it's a human construct designed primarily to help us act in the world. The same goes for metric space, incidentally. We act automatically, almost like objects, when we display habitual movements, but we feel at our most subjective when we're back in the past, exploring our memories. However, my very subjectivity, my entire personality, if you want to use those terms, is the result of duration. Duration is what produces subjectivity. We live in and through duration. Now, one or two films are actually going to show this whole process of the way in which duration makes us what we are. And Deleuze has some quite interesting ones, a Soviet historical epic. For example, perhaps the most accessible example is Hitchcock's Vertigo. If you know the film, you might try and think about how it might show how experience affects people's personality. Most films are going to show not the whole process, but parts of it. There are other implications, although these do not figure explicitly in Deleuze's discussion of film. One is that other living things and inanimate ones also experience duration. They do not have memories of experiences like we do, but they are also occupying a particular interval in time, and that has given them particular characteristics and qualities. We do not always see how important the dimension of time is, but it is universal and constant. We can see that human beings or animals age, that buildings and machines wear out and decay. But everything is changing through time. Even something as apparently solid as a piece of rock is slowly and continually being eroded by wind and water. We cannot dispense with the dimension of time if we want to understand things, especially as the present moment, which can seem so important, is actually almost irrelevant in the great scheme of things compared to the past. Again, clock time seems unsuitable to grasp these very different paces and periods of duration. We argued this in the video on Hexiety. Deleuze also has little interest in grand forces or great plans that seem to steer time, destiny or fate, although we do see those in some films, including the movement image films. To revert back to human action for a moment, why is the present moment not very important? It's clear that things I do in the present are intended to have an impact in the future. I study hard now in order to gain a qualification next year, say. It's also true that the present moment rapidly turns into the past, so that what I began five minutes ago is already past. 
I still feel the effects of the past because it's always crowding in on me, always affecting my perceptions, pushing me on through a series of present moments, trying to actualize itself in the language of Bergson. It's hardly surprising that for Bergson and Deleuze, trying to pin things down to what they're actually like here and now in the present is not very fruitful because the present is a mere point in the passage of time between past and future. In general, this is going to have considerable importance, for example, in criticizing any attempts to isolate states of objects or people in the present, locate them at any simple point of time in order to study them and generalize them about them, which is what most science does. What's really happening in the whole of reality is what Bergson calls a state of general becoming. Not stasis, but a constant process of time passing and changing things, linking past and future to the present. Now you might be aware that for Deleuze, becoming is a crucial concept, and that Deleuze and Guattari, 2004, that's a thousand plateaus, have a lot of deliberately spectacular examples where men become horses or women, for example. In film, as we'll see, there are some examples of this constant becoming, especially in one particular image, the crystal image. And there are examples of where the objectivity and independence of time and becoming is also demonstrated. One more thing about duration. If we think of our own experiences, it is clear that things need not have happened in the way they did. I could have chosen to go to a different university. I could have a different job, partner or child. There is a whole set of possibilities, only some of which have been realised. Again, the same applies to animals and objects as well. A proper philosophical account of duration takes these into account. In Deleuzean terms, duration is a multiplicity, another key term, a cluster of related but different possibilities. Some get realised, while others remain as virtual or potential. The point is that time image cinema shows us all or some of these characteristics of time as duration, not all at once necessarily. Movement image cinema describes us when we act almost automatically or habitually. So real men instinctively know how to respond to crisis and their actions are almost immediate and automatic. They solve problems with action. But cinema increasingly comes to want to try and represent the effects of memory and time as well. Partly as a reaction to films dominated by the movement image, which incidentally were also seen as largely American and so European filmmakers wanted to react. We also saw in the earlier video that it's no longer easy to react predictably or automatically to settings after everything has been turned upside down, say by war or crisis. How do people actually live now in a ruined city like Berlin in 1945? That's the theme of Rossellini's 1948 film Germany Year Zero as Deleuze notes. There are also technological developments in cinema which enabled directors and writers to depict things non-realistically, including depicting the effects of memory or subjective states. These are discussed in the first commentary on Bergson, chapter 3, in Deleuze's book on the time image. Now we have to remember here that Bergson himself did not study cinema but analyse natural perception instead. So Deleuze has to particularly work to connect his work to the cinematic image specifically. Remember that what we actually see on the screen for Deleuze are visual or sonic signs and they show us what Bergson described as images which are conceptions in between ideas and things as we said in the earlier video. Anyway, there's an early turn away from normal automatic movement in cinema and the first sign of this turning away is the appearance of abstract or pure optical or sound signs. 
So going back to post-war films, for example, the ruined landscape of Berlin offers shots of buildings and streets which don't look like buildings and streets anymore, but which look like abstract paintings. And as a result, they no longer belong to the familiar world of automatic action. They're no longer available for any normal action at all. People can't live in them or walk down them. If they're not so clearly tied to automatic action, they must only be available for interpretation by memory. And this is what they do. These pure signs prompt recollection. They become recollection images as a first stage to engage memory, still close to perception and action as we saw, but not automatic. Instead, rather attentive, as Bergson puts it. We find these developments in early experimental film, but even in popular film, as we shall soon see. Before we start discussing actual films or film techniques, it is necessary to say that probably all the techniques that Deleuze describes have now all become clichés too. They are now all pretty familiar, although they were once shockingly new. A lot of recent films deliberately parody techniques used in serious film sometimes in the form of homages or pastiches. The techniques are no longer closely linked to the serious intent to do philosophy. They have become much more playful and aimed at entertainment. We are not supposed to leave the cinema philosophizing. What we're talking about here is the cultural development usually called postmodernism, And of course, it happened after Deleuze wrote about cinema. It is also worth noting that in many cases Deleuze is talking about the views of other critics about films as much as the films themselves. We should also bear in mind throughout that Deleuze's reading is a particular philosophical one. Let's return to Deleuze's era and look at his example of how time is depicted directly. We mentioned recollection and dreaming earlier. One technique is to use the flashback to indicate a part of the life in the past which is being recalled in the memory and there are also dream sequences. Deleuze provides us with lots of examples but he particularly likes those which challenge naturalism or realism and oppose straightforward linear narrative. Quite often flashbacks and dreams do not do this and both can appear as a kind of sidestep or pause, filling in a gap somewhere without disturbing the normal course of events. So flashbacks, for example, used to be introduced by the screen image dissolving and sometimes strange music in order to fill out a bit of the story. Deleuze likes flashbacks that do something different, that show us a fork, as he puts it, a fork in time, a moment when things could have been different, where different possibilities are revealed. Remember, this is a characteristic of duration. The films of Joseph Mankiewicz are his examples, and they include even the blockbuster Cleopatra. Turning to dreams, they used to be clearly indicated as not real by the use of various visual clues, such as slow motion or bizarre characters. Deleuze discusses a classic Buster Keaton film, Sherlock Jr., one of those which you can now watch free online, incidentally, where there is a dream sequence. It starts with the, a clever bit of superimposition with the character splitting into two, and the dream half of the character goes through the screen, as it were. All the time we see a separate screen, we know we're looking at a dream, even though the two screens do finally merge for a few minutes at the end. However, the best examples of dreams also leave us with ambiguity about what is dream and what is reality, what is the past and what is the present. Deleuze calls these implied dreams, and they also offer an implied philosophical criticism of reality and the demonstration of its connection with states of consciousness. There are cases where everything is normal, for example, except that the world is moving strangely around the character. And uh, the end sequence of Lawton's classic film, The Night of the Hunter, offers a good demonstration of this. It's rather eerie, the way the landscape appears to 
slide past the children in the boat. I should say here that a lot of cinema dream sequences are also inspired by Freudian theory and show us the unconscious. But Deleuze is no fan of Freud by the time he wrote the cinema books and so he doesn't use Freudian terminology or discuss it. Bergson also discusses various psychological problems with memory which include things like having hallucinations or developing amnesia. These are also shown on film. Deleuze finds some philosophical significance here as well because these episodes at least show the disconnections between mental life and normal life based on action. I myself find that a bit forced. They show that the mind has its own material that it works with in an effective way. Again, the best films for Deleuze are the ones that refuse to differentiate between hallucination and normal life, say, but rather show the connections. There are actually some very conventional genre which can be read in this way, including, would you believe, musical comedies and burlesque. The musical, for example, was often seen as depicting an idealised world alongside the mundane one, a dream world if you like, and it also displays the possibilities of going from one to the other. Deleuze especially likes those sequences where a character's everyday walk turns into a dance. For example, I suppose the classic one is Singing in the Rain. The same can even be said of comedies, where ordinary actions suddenly shift into a strange world of comic events. Things go wrong, disasters accumulate beyond human control and so on. Jerry Lewis films are mentioned here. In Deleuze's hands, Jerry Lewis becomes a philosopher. Dream sequences show whole circles of connection between the objects in our dreams. Again, if you look at Sherlock Jr., you'll see this happening. In his dream, balancing chairs turn into Keaton balancing on the edge of a cliff, then recovering his balance in a jungle with lions and so on, in a series of jump cuts matched on action. Freud explains these links and their logic in his great work on dreams, Freud 1977, but as we said, Deleuze is not a fan, so he just describes the objects as anamorphoses, distorted projections of each other. However, the circuit linking images can be shrunk into smaller and smaller circles, even right down to a point at which objects themselves trigger off whole associations of projected images directly. And this is the concept of the crystal image. I don't find this work very easy. It might help us to get a grip if we think of those school science experiments where a super saturated solution of something, copper sulfate say, was used to grow a crystal. Normally what you do is suspend a little tiny object in the solution to seed the process and the crystal goes around it. Well I've given a web link um, which demonstrates it if you've forgotten. As the crystal grows it shows us what was a liquid turning into a solid, both states at the same time. If we were to get philosophical we could say we see a past state liquid turning into a present one, solid, or the liquid showing its potential to create a solid, a virtual state turning into an actual one. And you'll remember that this is also a key quality of duration, so the crystal image shows us time at work. It is a time image. In cinematic terms, the process can be described as a virtual image crystallizing into an actual optical image, a simultaneous double as Deleuze calls it, page 68. A crystal image is one which is capable of showing us both the virtual and the actual. Perhaps the easiest case is the mirror, where the image in the mirror reflects an actual character but then becomes actual itself, takes on a life of its own, and we can't distinguish the mirror image and the character. Let's think of a homely example. When you go off to your new job, you check yourself in the mirror first to see if you look like a suitable applicant. 
And then, if you like, it's the suitable applicant that leaves the house and goes off to the job interview, leaving the actual character behind. As the most accessible example, Deleuze mentions the mirror sequence towards the end of Orson Welles' film The Lady from Shanghai. Both characters have already appeared as ambiguous people with different aspects to themselves, and in the maze of mirrors they just reflect themselves endlessly. There are lots of other examples of doubled images as well. The effect is to raise doubts about what we knew about the characters before. Their concrete actuality dissolves, as Deleuze puts it. Almost the reverse of crystallization, a bit like one of Bergson's examples of crystals of sugar dissolving in hot water. Deleuze then has an interesting aside about actors themselves actualizing a virtual role, and when it's done well, becoming invisible as an actual person. And again, we can think of virtuoso performances of classic roles, I suppose, so that Laurence Olivier becomes Richard III and disappears into the role. Deleuze also talks about films where strange things happen, like when ventriloquist dummies become real. Or, in the excellent film Freaks, where the monstrous freak show people reveal their full humanity after all. Now, as an aside, I think this is a good example of Deleuze assuming a pretty critical viewer here who's not taken in by the realism of the action or their own preconceptions, but who can stand back and read film philosophically. Probably need quite a lot of cultural capital to do that. As other familiar examples, there is the ship in Moby Dick. The ship is ostensibly a commercial whale ship. That's one of its aspects of its image. But it's also the seed for scenes from some dreadful cosmic drama that's been years in the making. Ahab has been brooding below decks ever since being disabled by the whale. Or there's the hotel in Last Year in Marionbad, scene of the unfolding of two different stories where quite different things happened in the past, all of them perfectly possible alternatives. Well, Deleuze talks of lots of other examples in Tarkovsky, who's keen on mirrors, and Fellini, who's keen on seeds, for example. Another device showing us how time works is the film within the film, or films about making films. I must say my own favourite here is Truffaut, Day for Night, although Deleuze doesn't mention it. And again, the point is it makes it hard to distinguish the real film or, for that matter, the reality that the film is filming. There are films about producing other works of art too, like Godard's Passion, Passion, which uh, concerns a group of artists who are painting classical tableau of people. For some critics, this was seen as an exhausted form of cinema, because cinema's closing in on itself, but for Deleuze, films in film also show the capacity of film to produce these special crystal images, doubled images. It's even possible to use them to offer a kind of self-criticism, showing the material reality combined with the artistic film. For example, including the need to organise the finances. And again, my favourite is not mentioned by Deleuze, it's Godard's Tout va bien. And the film starts with lots of checks being signed in order to make the film. The doubling of these images, showing the connections between actual and virtual, or actual and potential, are related directly to Bergson's philosophy. And what it shows, what these examples show, is one of the interesting things about the present, which we discussed earlier. Past is always there in the present. The present image also contains its past. In Bergson's terms, the present is always dividing or splitting, and one element of it passes and becomes virtual. It turns into material for recollection or pure memory, and is thus available to raise new possibilities or potentials for present action. Our past selves affect our present ones. Anyway, with images like these, crystal images, we can see time in the crystal, as Deleuze puts it. 
Of course, that assumes you're a philosopher. I sometimes suspect that a Deleuzian could see time in just about any shot or sequence, once they'd acquired the right philosophical blinkers. Lots of examples follow, including a discussion of Renoir's classic film La Règle du Jeu, Rules of the Game, which in Deleuze's hands shows several mirror structures linking different orders. The most obvious one is the reflection of upper-class life in the simultaneous life of the servants below stairs. There's also a character, the gamekeeper, who can operate in both worlds, and he has an important role here because he introduces a temporary disruption or crack in the crystal by shooting one of his fellow workers. All crystal images need a crack in order to move on, perhaps. Deleuze suggests that we might even call this movement a line of flight, to cite one of his most popular terms. There are other options as well, including what might be seen as failures of the crystalline to crystallize. For example, when recollections or memories arrive too late to have an effect. Visconti's films apparently demonstrate these qualities. Finally, for this bit, there's also an interesting discussion of sounds acting as something uniting past and present. And the example here is the ritornello, or refrain, a recurring theme in musical compositions. Uh, when you hear it for the second or third time, it evokes the past times you've heard it. And the ritornello is actually another concept much discussed in the great work A Thousand Plateaus. Eventually, we get on to two other important conceptions of time, having done flashbacks, dreams and crystals. And this time, we're going to understand time as a sheet of the past, first, and then as a series of presents. The sheet notion is fairly easy because it recalls an actual model of memory in Bergson, Memory as a whole is represented as an inverted cone balancing on its point. The point of the cone represents the present in its contact with our common sense notion of reality. The much larger base of the cone represents pure memory. We can think of layers or sheets in the cone representing regions of memory closer and closer to the present and to action as you head towards the point. Orson Welles's films, especially Citizen Kane, are going to show us these sheets of time. Characters in the film are asked to recall something about Kane, and they do this by jumping back into regions of the past, and we see a series of events which happen then and there. We can also see that these sheets do not correspond exactly with each other, and they can't be organised in terms of some sort of notion of being more or less close to some agreed truth. Nor are they simply under conscious control. The people writing the obituary are particularly interested in what Cain meant by his last word, Rosebud. But none of them, he wouldn't have had a Portsmouth accent of course, but none of them can form a precise recollection image to explain it, try as they might. The discussion of Wells is particularly interesting and full. It's found in chapter 5, and I, if, I think you'll probably enjoy it. It also brings in notions like how the deep focus shot, which Wells helped to pioneer, acts a bit like the crystal we examined just now. What happens is that figures in the past are seen in the deep background, and present action is seen in the rather exaggerated foreground but both are linked together and figures can even interact. In this way, we can come to see temporality itself as an independent dimension. We witness the continuity of duration, a depth of time, not space. Regions of time linked to other regions. In perhaps the most famous example of a deep focus shot, well there are several, we can see what pushed Susan into attempted suicide. As she suffers in the foreground, Cain enters through a door in the far background and he moves towards her as an indication of his bad influence on her over time. I find the notion of peaks of the present slightly more difficult. 
I think it follows from what was said about the crystal showing us present, past and future. For Bergson, as we saw, the actual present moment is rather elusive, somewhere between past and future, and it's really quite hard for us to form a stable notion of the actual present. What we tend to do in practice is operate with different senses of the present. Not so much the actual moment, but a present related to the past and a present related to the future. If we philosophize hard enough, we can use this sort of experience to realize that chronological time is not very helpful. There's something behind it. Even though we can pin down a moment in chronological time, doesn't help us really understand real time. Instead, we can think of a peak present or a peak of, of the present, one which informs us particularly well about objects and their pasts, as well as present, one which offers us a useful view of events. What seems to happen is something like this. We activate the chronological past of an event and bring it into the present, adding together past and present characteristics to develop a clear understanding of the object, a clear point of view. This is not very different from what a philosophical grasp of the event is supposed to do as well, because events have a past as well as a present, and I've discussed this a bit on the video on the hexiety. The point is, I think, that cinema provides us with excellent opportunities to develop this sort of enhanced perception by linking past and present. Again, last year in Marienbad is a good example. Each character offers recollection images, which we see on screen as reconstructions of events, but none of their recollection images show fully what happened. Deleuze argues that, for Rene at least, this was the whole point, to show that the full past is never grasped in the character's recollection images, but that the film as a whole can do this and provide an enhanced or peak view in the present. This is one way to read the film, as a deliberate construction, a work of art, to show a past that has a real and independent existence which escapes any subjective attempt to grasp it. Deleuze cites other Rene films which pursue the autonomy and separation of levels of time not grasped in subjective recollection. This justifies cinema as one art form that does better than subjective memory showing the fragments of the past beyond any subjective grasp and then showing how they can be linked to each other artistically, breaking with naturalism or realism in montage and in depth shots. These links are non-natural but important, creatively and politically. Once cinema gets the general idea of breaking with naturalism, it continues to do so, challenging natural naturalist, linear forms of narrative, organic notions of composition, and so on. These notions are difficult to sustain as true accounts if there is no longer any agreement on past events, what happened or what happened first. Some cinema sets out to be deliberately pedagogic in this sense, hoping to correct or challenge common sense ideas about time and events and open up new possibilities. Well, the rest of the book goes on to discuss various art house or avant-garde movies as examples of these non-natural, even downright false, depictions and connections developed in the name of art or politics. This video is already a bit long, so I'm going to leave that to you to explore. Good luck.